Welcome to the Zoom Pro Show on the Barroom Sports Talk Network. I'm Dan Pro, joined by my esteemed colleague, Brian, even though he still is looking for friends, and now he's found another one. <laughs> and we are joined by the voice of college football, Mr. Mark Rogers of Mark Rogers TV. Mark, how are you? I'm doing just fine, and I think that maybe if I get on here and prove myself, then I will next time be an esteemed guest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we look to hope to have you on more often, and then I guess Brian usually does drink with me, but he's just too whiny to not drink during this, the morning. This January, we're doing dry January. December was rough. We had all that time off, so I'm doing a dry January. No no beer, especially at 1130 this morning where we're doing a little bit early morning. It feels a little too early to crack it. How about you, James? You, you, you need to double down on February. That's, that's <laughs> exactly. right. That's right. It might be a more rough month for that one. Uh, that's right. So it, I am drinking something called Sunshine Daydream. It is a nice. session India Pale Ale, and it's you a, like it. I'll yeah. tell you. <laughs> that's my first. The, <laughs> the 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 Colts game yesterday had me uh, tempted to. As a Colts fan, I was tempted to break dry January, but held through. So I think we're good for the rest of the month. That's uh, we'll see from there. Uh, that fourth down play at the end of the first half was rough. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. And then the the, the drive that in, that followed that. So, but. But hey, we're not a Colts podcast. We're we're trying to stay focused here on Notre Dame and and going forward. But James, you want to kind of go back to the Rose Bowl and do a recap from that? Yeah, well, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta say, I mean, that was it was a better performance out of Notre Dame than I thought they were going to be. Yeah. Um, and Mark, you can I don't know from what you saw what what did you see out of Notre Dame out of that game. So I can play right off of exactly that little short little summary (laughs) and then not necessarily better than I thought. I think it pretty much went to script Mm -hmm. in regards to the improvement that the program has made, but also the gap that still exists Uh, because along the line of scrimmage, I don't think that it was anywhere close to a dominant Alabama performance. I thought Notre Dame held up very well along the line of scrimmage Um, was able to move, you know, not gaping holes, but move the ball on the ground at times Um, and and all of that. Uh, You know, one of the the, uh, indicators, I think, of where this game was going to go or the confidence that uh, intelligent people or reasonable people had going into this game was every time I heard uh, a Notre Dame breakdown, including the ones that I had, a number of them, on my channel was, okay, where does Notre Dame have the advantage? Where can we go for a Notre Dame advantage where they can uh, look to go? And it was always the tight end. It was always the, the tight end stable is amazing, and it is. Yes. Uh, but when that's your go-to, uh, you need a whole lot of 12-yard completions to, <laughs> to be able to break through and get something done. So, so that was difficult. And the one thing I will say, James and Brian, uh, before I let you guys go off on it, is that – the touchdown drive that was meaningful during when the game was still a game that I yep. believe made it 21 seven. That was both the, the, the game plan and the formula for a win, but it also underlined why Notre Dame wasn't going to win the game because that was a beautiful drive. It was a grinded out every time they converted a third down, it was by that much yep. and they just played it to perfection. And so I'm sitting there thinking they're doing exactly what they need to do. They're keeping the ball for like eight minutes, keeping Alabama's offense on the sideline. They're making every third down conversion by about three feet, and they are playing a perfect drive uh, to formula. But can they do this four or five times? Four four quarters, yeah. No, they can't. They really can't. Uh, You can't have a drive where you have a penalty, a sack a negative play, a dropped pass. You can't have that. You have to have the perfect formula. And how many times is that going to happen? And it happened one time during a meaningful (laughs) series uh, in the game. Yeah, I I think that's a great point. And, you know, when you're comparing it of growth in the program, I keep coming back to that 2012 game, or I guess 2013 game against Alabama in in the title game, where I think you, you've talked about the, the physicality, the, at the offensive line, defensive line for, you know, this year's game, but back then it was Alabama just ran all over Notre Dame. I thought even even the defense we had that year, uh, it, it was clear that Notre Dame really wasn't on the same physicality level, let alone talent level and explosiveness. Uh, and you know, I think 
Notre Dame closed the gap there and showed that at least on a national stage. And that's what some of what Kelly talked about after the game. Uh, but I thought it, it, it went exactly to your point, maybe how we, we thought Notre Dame would play. And, and James and I kind of had our predictions from last uh, pregame. Um, and both of us kind of had a score close to where it ended up of, of if this got out of, out of hand, uh, multiple scores, I think in, at least what ended up 31, 14 closer than, uh, than maybe the, that old 2012 game, but still, uh, not as competitive as Notre Dame fans would like. James, what did you think? Honestly, I, I thought it was a better performance in the second half, especially at the defense. Uh, one thing I noticed was that. One, I think one of the key talking points we made in the last podcast was that Najee Harris was <clears throat> very key in stopping. And even though I'm looking at the numbers right here, he's, he rushed for 125 yards. He only got 79 yards in just the first quarter and 53 yards on that one long play where he <laughs> hurtled over uh, the defender. And um, But otherwise, they really pretty much contained him. Well... <laughs> Well, yeah. It, it, besides, if you take the explosive plays out, I, I always <laughs> love that that line. Like, if you take that one seventy nine yard run, that one long you know, TD run out of it, but but oftentimes those elite players, that's how they get their their yards on those explosive plays. Yeah. Um, Najee Harris is one of those players. So, I mean that that play alone showed a lot. Like, just, not that there's this wide gap in talent, just that at the elite individual level for for the top tier players in college football and i don't think you know, alabama has the three four of those on their team uh what that can do and what can th- that can look like on a football field uh it just looks like an nfl player playing college players yeah uh, i'm guessing that you guys have seen that play maybe once too many times <laughs> yeah. i think i have and i don't even yeah. have an investment in the game oh okay, yeah twitter twitter loved it yeah I think I saw an ESPN breakdown where they showed it from about 42 different angles and slow-mo and threw all Let's sorts of uh, metrics on it. That's right. Uh, all I know is I went, to work science. The, I went to work the next day and I saw it and I was like, God, come on, guys. This is like, give me trauma. But and one of the other things that it was kind of hard for them to stop was Alabama's offense. I mean, that offense is just incredible. I mean, Devontae Smith, had 130 yards, three touchdowns, and then he just won the Heisman. And then Max Jones was 25 for 30 with 297 yards and four touchdowns. I mean, it's really hard for any defense, in my opinion, to contain that offense. Yeah, and and Kelly talked a little bit about that, of just Smith in in particular, I think, just out on the sidelines, him making plays and showed why he was, you know, the first – Wide receiver, I think, th- since is it Desmond Howard to win the the Heisman? He showed it all throughout the game that he was just another level of athleticism and explosiveness that that Notre Dame and not really anyone in college football can contain. So, uh, coming back to a little bit of our conversation last week, James, where you know people were frustrated with Brian Kelly or maybe Notre Dame's inability to perform in big big games, um, I don't think anyone can contain Devonta Smith or, or Najee Harris, so, at least at the college football level. So um, it, 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 I, that's why Alabama was number one and is favorited here even in the uh, national title game on Monday. Oh, yeah. And that actually is going into our next point is talking about Brian Kelly's comments after the post game. He essentially was just not happy with the media, not praising the season that they had, and hates being asked, like, why isn't Notre Dame – at that championship level. And I can understand his frustrations. Now, maybe some of the stuff that he said, he could have taken a little bit of accountability, but I don't know what you guys thought of that uh, post game stuff. And Mark, well, <laughs> Kelly, Mark would interested in your opinion of, of maybe Kelly's comments. So anytime a coach has comments to make that aren't um, in, in response to a question, that's the most flattering you always have to think, okay, not to judge the, the individual's character, but are they telling the truth or not? Are they just spilling their guts or are they sending a message that's filtered in some way or are they just giving you the coach speak? Certainly wasn't the coach speak necessarily. 
I think Brian Kelly's in a difficult position. I liken it to Jim Harbaugh trying to get over the Ohio State hump <laughs> where I just mm. think and, – and I'm not comparing Notre Dame and Michigan, the state of the program at this point. Yeah. No, well, we no, could have made that, that comparison <laughs> two years ago, but uh, Notre Dame continues to progress and Michigan is just falling off the rails. But uh, just in regards to the frustration level of – and I remind people of this that, that call into my show all the time. And it's not an excuse because these guys are being paid – just ridiculous amounts of money Lots to of money, win yeah. championships, to compete at the highest level. But if you were as good at your job as Brian Kelly was, or is as, at his job, I, I think uh, people would be pretty pleased with you. So let's understand there's 130 teams playing football. There's about 75 in Power 5, and he's at the top 4 to 5 level. And... It's just, it's a difficult climb. And, and I got to think that the perfectionist in him, the competitor in him, all that is thinking, okay, we can do this. We're getting there. We've taken strides, but maybe there's some doubt creeping in that, is this ever going to happen? What do I have to do? I've, we're grinding. We're doing everything we can. We're quality controlling this thing as much as possible. And are we ever going to get there? especially considering some of the limitations on the program from an academic standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to totally agree with you on that one. And I think what you were mentioning is like of the 130 schools that play, um, Alabama, Ohio State, and Clemson all were combined 109 and 8 since 2018, while Notre Dame is 33 and 5 in that same stretch. Now, for other context, Oklahoma was 33 and 6, Georgia was 31 and 7, and LSU was 30 and 8. And those are the other Power 5 schools with 30 wins in that stretch. And then you have some other Group 5 schools that have had some 30 wins there too. So they're just simply not at the level of Clemson, Ohio State, and Alabama. And the talent level is clearly just drastic, even though they're at least a top five program. Well, and, and to Mark's point, I think some of it was a little bit of frustration after the game, uh, just with, with Kelly's competitiveness. You, you could see maybe he let a little bit more go than he does in most press conferences and uh, uh, let some of the reporters hear it for you know, trying to change the narrative from what the questions are coming in towards him, uh, at least on the state of Notre Dame's program. And, and obviously, you know, there's this as much – praise as the Notre Dame program gets there's plenty of haters on the other side who'd love to see them lose uh so so they would love to have this as the the storyline that Notre Dame can never perform in these top games um but I, I I do think they're making progress as a program I think you know anyone who uh we, we, James we talked about this last week anyone who's calling for for you know Kelly's removal or some sort of you know whatever is it, just ridiculous and it shouldn't be listened to uh just <laughs> where they are currently so um, there's, there's growth to be had in the program, I think going forward. Um, it's going to be tough with, with book, you know, leaving, graduating and, uh, kind of resetting the talent, but, you know, Kelly's shown that he's built a program the last four or five years, been great years for Notre Dame football. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is like, I, my gripe with Notre Dame fans is like, what is Kelly supposed to do when there's that yeah. wide gap of talent? And this calling for his firing is just absurd. I mean, the guy is tied for second in school history and wins with Lou Holtz. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think anyone who's serious, who's not just trying to get like a Twitter shock is, is actually calling for his firing, but maybe, maybe some are, I just, it's, it's hard for me to understand that. So guys, while winning is the bottom line, do you think that there would be less angst against Brian Kelly if he was a little bit more likable? <laughs> well, he's certainly not likable here in Cincinnati. Um, but, um, yeah, I see what you're yeah. getting at. I see what you're getting at. I, I think a lot of people just want to, um, I don't know, be blunt or just think the way he they think or something like that. Um, it, it, I, I, I don't know what this, the best way of putting it is. He has calmed down and is a little more likable than maybe where he was uh, at the start of his Notre Dame career, especially on the sidelines, and he's even acknowledged that. And I think that's gone a long way um, to his likability factor. Uh, to draw a parallel to another Notre Dame coach, like Charlie Weiss was never very likable um, and, and didn't, didn't do himself any favors in the press to make himself likable. And I think that, in a way, shortened his 
leash, right, with the kind of Notre Dame fan base and, and the media at large. So uh, of maybe your your time till out the door is a little bit reduced by your attitude. I think that's a small impact on it at all. Um, and I don't think Kelly's anywhere near there. But, but yeah, I, I do think some of it is people just don't like Brian Kelly, especially here in Cincinnati. Uh, there's still a lot of... Uh, you know, scars, uh, I would say, amongst the Cincinnati fan base uh, that, that, that uh, haven't healed yet. <laughs> All right. And so now going into our next uh, talking point is now that Ian Book is going to be leaving uh, the school, um, I was going to do a segment about um, who, what they should do about the quarterback position. And I was thinking, oh, maybe they should go after a transfer or they should get someone like Tyler Buckner in there and then ironically i was watching your video mark and i was like all right i'm gonna do something where uh talk about maybe them getting jack cone they got jack cone and so anyways he's a graduate transfer from wisconsin he started 18 games in 2018 and 2019 for the badgers um so he let me look at these stats it says that he is pet wow He's completed 68% of his passes. He's got 3,728 yards, 23 touchdowns, and eight interceptions. So let's kind of talk about this um, transfer. Uh, Mark, you have the floor. (laughs) Yeah, I think his uh, TD to pick ratio, if I remember correctly, for his one starting season there when they went to the Rose Bowl was like 19 to 5. So that was certainly effective. Uh, I think the problem that you're going to run into – that is tied to our last topic is that if you're looking to win a national championship, I don't know that he's the guy. Right. Is yeah. he capable? Is he experienced? Um, did he run that Wisconsin offense? Well, yeah, they, they had a really good season that year. They, they lost a very odd game to Illinois where there was a, they were a 32 point favorite in that game it was the biggest point spread upset of the, the season. But other than that, a couple games to Ohio state, Very understandable losses to a team that was one of the three best last year. And then the Rose Bowl was an odd game in which, if you look statistically and watch the game, Wisconsin should have won the game. They did a lot of stupid things. Uh, It took Oregon with Justin Herbert at quarterback until the final drive of the game to go to eclipse 200 yards of total offense, and they won the game, 28-27. Special team stuff went wrong. So Jack Cohn led a very – tailback-oriented Jonathan Taylor offense when he could throw you a lot of uh, 14 for 21 days for 187 yards and a touchdown, no picks. Uh, And so coming off Ian Book, unless Jack Cohn really develops, I don't know that he's going to meet the Ian Book standard even. Yeah, I would agree with you, Mark. I think I haven't seen much of his, you know, the 2019 Wisconsin play. Um, but from what I've read and what I've seen in stats, he, he comes across as an experienced game manager. And especially when you talk about that Wisconsin offense back then of don't turn the ball over. Uh, we're primarily a, a running offense behind this offensive line. Uh, and maybe that's what Kelly's looking for is just someone in this period, this year of to come in with experience kind of manage this still very talented Notre Dame team uh, that, that maybe isn't, I don't know, with Book leaving and some of the, the graduates and on the defensive side, I see this as like talented-wise, maybe not as good as the team we just saw play Alabama uh, next year, but maybe maybe they could prove me wrong. I still think Mark, or sorry, Jack Cohn is going to be uh, maybe the best, best option they have next year. Um, and, and it's an improvement from what they had on their roster. It's going to be interesting to see if, you know, uh, there's going to be a little competition and if Brian Kelly will look to do a QB by committee, which I know he's done in the past, um, and, and play the quarterback he feels gives him the best chance to win, even within a game, uh, within a drive. He's done that in, in prior years. He's gotten away from that in the last few years, but uh, interesting what it will look like next year. James, what do you think? I think, honestly, I really liked it a lot because it's going to give competition to someone like Tyler Buckner, Drew Pine, Brendan Clark. Now, that might mean someone like Drew Pine or Brendan Clark are going to transfer away, but at least this gives some sort of certainty of the quarterback position going into later this year. And 
I'm okay with having experience at the quarterback position. It may not be the absolute best option, but, you know, at least it kind of goes into – he fits into the scheme of Brian Kelly's offense. So. Yeah, one, one thing I saw interesting that I didn't know, uh, that Jack Cohn was actually offered a, a lacrosse scholarship at Notre Dame uh, <laughs> before his football playing days and, and was – then, you know, always had, must, must have had ties to Notre Dame. And then I think his, uh, Tommy Reese's dad offered him a scholarship at Wake Forest to go play there, um, or at least was part of the, the development team that offered him that, that scholarship. So obviously there were some ties here that brought him back to Notre Dame. Um, and I think Kelly, you know, this, this transfer makes sense for the Notre Dame program for next year. And uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see where they go. If, if Cohn has developed significantly from, coming off his injury uh, maybe they can compete for college football playoff uh, bid but but otherwise I think he's he's a good game manager for next year I take it, it may have sounded a little negative I, I don't oh. want to disparage Jack Cohn I, I do think it's a, a valuable addition to the quarterback room uh, as an experienced guy who led a winning team who played in a lot of big games that year and maybe with the opportunity to broaden his skill set and expand and show what he can do. Maybe he'll be able to uh, provide more dynamic plays downfield and he's going to have better weapons than he had at Wisconsin. Yeah. I agree. I 100% agree with that one. But now let's kind of go into our next top talking points are the recruiting class for Notre Dame. Yep. Um, I found what was interesting with the zero five-star recruits, but 11 four-stars. So some the top recruit they got was a tackle – Named Black uh, Blake Fisher, who's number fifty-two overall, a guard named Rocco Spindler, uh, obviously Tyler Buckner at quarterback, Dion Colsey at wide receiver, Prince Colley at linebacker, and Kane Barong, who's a four-star, and he's the number eight tight end overall in this class. And then, of course, we have to mention Ron Paulus the third, just because of his father and everything. <laughs> and but the thing was what i noticed is the recruiting class even though there was no five star recruits got a number nine ranking and mark i want to know your thoughts on that recruiting class well my first prediction is that ron paulus the third is going to win three heismans <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think that goes back if anyone doesn't know to a comment made by vino cook about uh ron paulus uh the original quarterback there at notre dame so Again, it's my understanding when you look at um, Austin and McKinley that those were the two guys that you guys wanted to see, Notre Dame uh, supporters wanted to see on the field consistently this year to take that next step to provide. You guys have produced, um, I should say Notre Dame be more professional, not you guys, <laughs> have produced uh, – an upgraded wide receiver turned NFL wide receivers, but they seem to be the same type of wide receiver. And from the Notre Dame people that I talk to and what I read, I uh, really wanted to see those guys emerge as guys that could top, uh, take the top off the defense downfield. So I don't know if you, uh, that would be my first question about this recruiting class is those types of players, uh, and uh, that, that's pretty much my, my overall assessment would be that it's in line with what Brian Kelly has done there, and that's uh, yep. provided an upgrade in the recruiting and uh, something that is a, a tier below the very top, which that's where everybody else is in the Notre Dame, Michigan, Penn State, Auburn, Florida class. We could keep yep. going maybe with a few more. No, I would have to agree with you on that one. But one thing I've noticed, and I, we talked about in our uh, podcast, I think a couple of weeks ago, was it doesn't seem like that he's getting the most quality necessarily of the class. He's more getting a quantity, and he's developing a lot of depth. And so when, let's say, someone gets hurt, the next guy comes up, and they still can play at the same level as their starters. Yeah, we've, we, I mean, the, the rivals rankings, everything, the recruiting rankings are, are, are one metric to measure a coach. I, I come back to like the Georgia example, right? Georgia is always dominant in recruiting, except to me, they seem like they're right there with Notre Dame in kind of program prominence of, you know, second tier programs outside of these, uh, these programs, you know, winning, winning the national titles year in and year out. So 
yeah, maybe that goes to a little bit of Kelly's development. Um, you know, of the of the players, or just knowing his system and what players he needs to be competitive at that high level. But I think when you're in that conversation, the top ten recruiting classes, you're getting the talent to be a top ten program, and I think that's what Kelly's hoping for. If you see the those classes fall out into you know the late twenties, whatever it may be, then you maybe have the concerns. But uh, you know, Kelly knows what he wants to get, and there's always going to be competition for those elite top tier guys um those, those five stars as you mentioned james and speaking of georgia they actually stole running back i think the last name was edwards from georgia so that's another great um recruit i honestly think in the class but anyways going into our next talking point and speaking of scars here in cincinnati <laughs> um Notre Dame made a very incredible hire, hiring Clark Freeman, the defensive coordinator for Cincinnati. Uh, that defense last year was ranked fourth nationally. And so there's kind of that hope now that maybe they can get some of their recruits coming from out of Ohio. So, Mark, I would want, first of all, I want your thoughts on um, the hire itself and then what possibly Freeman can provide for Notre Dame. Anytime there's a coaching staff hire, and I really can't answer this question completely, but I, I got to think that it's not only just, is this person qualified for the job, but how do they fit in with what we do here, not just from a scheme standpoint, but more so from a personality and approach standpoint, how do they fit in with the rest of the coaching staff? You need, you need a coaching staff that's complementary. Uh, you know, you're good cops, you're bad cops, your, your experience versus your, and he would fill the role of um, a younger guy who yeah. was on the college football field himself not much more than a decade ago. So I would think he would be very relatable. And that's probably a big part of his success at Cincinnati is that he can um, communicate with his players well and uh, they can relate to him. Uh, had a really good career at Ohio State as a linebacker, played 51 games there, put in time at Kent State and Purdue before going to Cincinnati, certainly the, the numbers line up with what you would expect from a top uh, defensive coordinator. Uh, LSU was going after him. That's a good sign that, that again, was well the sought after. Was going after him. He was just the hot commodity uh, as a guy who, if you look at uh, Cincinnati's performance on defense the last three years, pretty much in every uh, meaningful statistic they were at the top of the league uh, so he was doing an outstanding job uh, I don't know whether to give this to his credit or not a concern but just to detract a little bit from his accomplishments head coach Luke Fickle also a big defensive guy yeah. played at Ohio State uh, was the defensive coordinator there uh, under Urban Meyer at, at uh, the beginning of his tenure so uh, you could either take the slant that that rubbed off on Marcus Freeman and he gained a lot of valuable experience or was Luke Fickle involved in the game plans and helping him? Uh, I'm sure it's a plus more than anything. Well, I'm sure yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, I'm sure it was, I know some of my Cincinnati friends, like our friend Kyle, uh, is probably wanting to put a, uh, a stake in my heart after <laughs> taking away another great Cincinnati coach. Um, well, unfortunately, I guess Zoom is telling me we have only eight minutes left in our conversation. But I think that's a good, <laughs> I think it's a good segue um, into our um, final talking point, which is our sidebar that I usually do on this podcast. And I think more, this first half of the sidebar is more directed towards you, Mark. Um, obviously, it's been the hot talking point. Um, I've talked about it on this podcast with Brian before. Uh, is expanding the college football playoffs. Um, what's your thoughts and what should they do? So we need to go to eight teams and uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Here's my deal. I think that the scheduling needs to go along with the reformatting of the playoff because you can't have a program like a USC scheduling Notre Dame and Alabama and just a loaded non-conference schedule and then have Baylor not play a ranked team outside the conference since 1995 you know, playing Lamar, Sam Houston State, and Rice every year. Uh, the, so there needs to be uh, both in-conference, but most notably outside of the conference, I think there needs to be a scheduling format. Take the, the scheduling outside the hands of the uh, 
individual programs and, and give a uh, formula to it. But that's uh, aside. So if we could fix the playoff, I think the first thing that you need to do is determine what do you do with a group of five? Uh, I think they're being teased right now. I think it's uh, we're patronizing them for teasing them, including them. We, we think we're including them or, you know, but if they, there have been, I believe, three to four undefeated teams, I could go through them in the last five years. The highest they've been ranked in the final rankings was eighth. So they're not being included. So you either officially include them or you exclude them and say, go play your own playoff or do whatever you want to do. That decision has to be made. You go to eight. And if you're going to include the group of five, you go with the five conference champions, uh, two at large. And I won't go through a whole metric on how that should be decided, but I think it should be more metric, less selection. And then you go with the group of five. uh, That's most likely going to be an undefeated or one loss team. I totally agree with you. I, I saw one that was interesting from Joe Klatt of uh, Fox Sports 1, where he's suggesting up to 16, maybe even doing 14, even doing 10. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's a lot of games to be played. But I, I think you're right. I, I think it has to be at eight teams. I mean, you're, and we, I know a lot of Cincinnati fans here are kind of wanting to uh, throw an angry mob at um, <laughs> the, the committee. Yeah, I mean that. I I think they they deserve to be in the playoffs. I just don't think they were better than the other four teams. Well, and I think for that point, they didn't deserve to be in the playoffs. Right? I think the playoffs are supposed to be your top top four best teams, and you choose from there. And the problem with it is there's it's subjective right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so Mark noted bringing in some metrics, some some uh, objective metrics that we could measure and. Maybe it's getting back to a little bit of a computer model plus a little bit of a, of a subjective side, a blended model. Um, but the playoff, I think everybody can agree, is better than one game. Um, and, and we all love more football. Uh, so I'm all for expanding to eight teams. I think that would be a great, great poll in, in bringing in some of these smaller schools and giving them a shot to really prove on a national stage. You, know, you don't have to wait until that bowl game and go, oh, Cincinnati maybe would have been great in a playoff uh, had we had that. And, and then say, what if uh, you actually have them in that tournament um, would be great. And you, you ha- there's a lot of logisticals. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. No, no problem. The only thing I'll say real quick about what I don't agree with, like the six, the 10 and the 14 is that it creates buys. And for anybody who wants buys, all you have to do is the NFL, the buys make sense because they were earned on an objective basis where the schedules are very similar in college football. You could go through any year. And if you say there should be six teams, so there's two buys, I would challenge anybody listening to go through every year and try to determine which two teams should have buys. I guarantee and the advantage given to the teams with buys, obviously you've guaranteed them a win. Number one, number two, no wear and tear. Number three, no risk of a major injury. And number four, they get to, they get to game plan and watch the other two teams yeah. play and strategize for like 10 days. So I just don't think it's fair. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that one, except maybe Alabama this year. But that's a different story. Um, and then uh, our final... <laughs> they don't like, need any more advantages. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but then the final um, part of this uh, sidebar would be Monday night. Obviously... It's the national championship. Uh, I know a lot of people here in Ohio are going to be very excited for what happens in this game. But, Mark, I'm going to start with you first. Predictions for the national championship game. So you mentioned predictions before we started recording. I was not prepared for a prediction. And if not made a prediction, I think that there are less question marks on the Alabama side. But I said the same thing before the Clemson game as well. Uh, I think the teams are basically equally talented. Uh, but Alabama played like the best team in the country for the entire season or 90% of it. And Ohio state showed up for one game and a half against Northwestern and a half against Indiana. So I will, I will give the probability factor to Alabama at about 75%. Uh, I've not made a prediction, but based on that, like 45, 34 Bama. All right. Yeah, I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. I have to give uh, Bama the edge as well, just with what we saw so far. And, and as Mark mentioned, throughout the whole year, not just uh, in the last few weeks of the season. So, James, what do you think? Uh, I'm thinking probably 49 to wow. 35. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's Alabama? Just, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, 
I know, I'm, uh, you know a lot of our friends from uh, who are Ohio State fans who are probably going to be very angry at me. <laughs> well, anyways, thank you so much, Mark. This does pretty much wrap it up. And um, hopefully you'll come on as a guest some other time soon. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah. And Thanks, then, Mark. And then I know Brian needs more friends. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to a Sunday of uh, NFL playoffs right now. So that's, that's about to get kicked off here. You're cool. Have a good one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now no, I've, I've shifted fanhood to the team that's playing Pittsburgh. That's, that's where I'm going <laughs> oh, now. Oh, I see it. Is. All right. Thank you so much. And please listen in our next podcast.